Hello everyone, I'm Luke Kennedy and I'm joining you for your lessons today. Let's see what's coming up. In English, we'll learn about persuasive language in advertisements. In maths, we'll solve money problems using fractions. And in science, we'll take a closer look at how people interact with the environment. That sounds good to me. Shall we begin? In her last few lessons, Pascal has been looking at persuasive language and how advertisers use it to sell products. Have you ever bought something because an ad convinced you that the product was awesome and that you just had to have it? Today, let's talk about how ads can make us want to buy a product and that sometimes an advertisement can promise more than the product actually delivers. Hello. Do you have a favourite ad? One that made you really want something? What was it about the ad that made it so good? Was it actually the product? Or was it the ad? Sometimes I'm influenced by an ad because of the song in it, or because there is a funny story that appeals to my sense of humour, or it has a puppy in it doing cute things. It's true. Sometimes the reasons I like an ad have absolutely nothing to do with the product. Today, we're going to look at the persuasive language advertisers use to try and make you desperately want to buy the product they are advertising. Let's be honest. An advertiser's job is to promote a product so that people will buy it. That is the purpose of an ad. They have to think about who they are selling to and how to persuade those people to buy. The people they are trying to sell to are called the target audience. Advertisers create different ads depending on their target audience. Car advertisements are mostly targeted at adults. Same with products like vitamins or insurance. You might not pay much attention to those ads. However, ads for toys are targeted at people your age. What other products can you think of that are targeted at children? And you know that all of these ads will use different persuasive techniques and visual elements to suit the ad. Do you remember some of the persuasive language techniques used in advertising? That's right. Advertisers can use noun groups to connect descriptive words and the product. Noun groups usually consist of a noun, an article like the, a or an, and one or more adjectives that give more information about the noun. Noun groups like an outstanding unmatched performance or massive turbojet power make us think that the product must be very impressive. And modal verbs and adverbs can be used to express the degree of certainty of actions or commands. Advertisers use high modality, which means they use verbs and adverbs with a high degree of certainty. For example, an advertiser wouldn't say, you might like this product, they would claim, you'll absolutely love this product. Both the adverb absolutely and the verb love have high modality. Advertisers can also use nonsense words and alliteration to make the product sound fun and appealing, especially when the target audience includes children. Consider nonsense words like zoomalicious or fastomatic, and alliteration like wild, wicked, and wonderful, or bright, brainy, and brilliant. Advertisers also rely on using commands which tell you to do something, such as rush out and buy, or get your hands on one today. They use statements like, voted best toy in Australia, to convince you it's a proven quality product, even if that isn't completely true. And we also know that advertisers can use exaggeration to make the product seem bigger or better 
than it actually is. This makes you believe that this product is beyond fantastic, that there's nothing else like it, and it will make all your dreams come true. These are some of the tricks advertisers draw upon to make their target audience want to part with their or a family member's money. When we read, view or listen to advertisements, we have reactions to them. Sometimes we have a negative reaction to the ad. Have you ever been talking to your friends about an ad and said something like, oh, I hate that ad? An ad that gives you a negative reaction is not really doing the job that the advertiser wants it to, is it? Advertisers are hoping that their ad makes you have a positive reaction, where we feel like we would like to find out more about the product and, ideally, something in the advertisement will make us want to own the product. Think of one of your favourite ads. Why did you have a positive reaction to it? Do you think you were in the target audience? What did it have that other ads don't? Can you think of any persuasive advertising tricks it used? Sometimes ads can backfire. They use persuasive language that makes a product sound bigger or better than it really is. It wouldn't feel good being persuaded to buy something that isn't what it promises to be. Have a look at this sad story. It's about Pinky catching up with their friend Gallico and swapping experiences they've had with products they've bought because of the claims in an ad. You look sad, Pinky. I am. I bought this camera and guess what? It doesn't work. I saw the ad for it on TV and it said it took perfect photos every time. It claimed that I would be the best photographer in town. But no, my photos are all so blurry. I've tried all the settings and every single photo was out of focus. Now the camera doesn't work at all. Oh, that's so bad. That happened to me once. I bought a Radzi racing car because the ad said it hugs the tracks with cunning precision. But it fell off its tracks all the time so it didn't go fast at all. I was so mad. It's so disappointing, Gallico. Why can't advertisers be honest about their products? I agree, Pinky. That is a sad story. Think about the advertisers' claims in the advertisement that persuaded these two characters to buy these products. Did the products live up to the advertisers' claims? Has this ever happened to you? Have you ever bought a game or a toy that wasn't quite the same as it looked in the ad? How important is it that the advertisers tell the truth about the products they are selling. Now, imagine you are making an ad for a toy. What kind of toy would it be? What are some nonsense words and alliteration you could use to try and sell your toy? Have some fun with it. Well, that's all for today. See you next time. Before the break, Pascal was talking about advertising, and I've had a bit of free time lately to notice just how many ads there are. They are everywhere. I've seen online ads, junk mail, and ads on giant billboards, and they're all suggesting that I buy something. So understanding how to calculate with money will help me spend it more wisely. 
Here's Annie to explain. Hi, everyone. Here is a shopping brochure I received in my letterbox yesterday. It is advertising some back-to-school specials. Hmm. I think I would like to buy a new student chair. This one is $89. I have two $50 notes, which is $100. That's more than I need for the chair, so I'll get some change. Let's work out how much change I'll get using a part, part, whole diagram and a number line. The whole is $100 and one part is $89. The change will be the other part. So to calculate the change, we're going to add on from 89 using the number line. Adding one gets to 90. Then adding 10 more gets to 100. So one add 10 is 11. We've found the missing part is 11. So when I buy the $89 chair with $100, I will get $11 change. Let's try another one using a different method. Markers are $2.25 each, or there is a special for three for $6.50. I'd like to buy three markers. And I have $7 in my purse. The whole is $7 and one part is $6.50. The change will be the other part. You can use any method you like to get the answer. In fact, you may even be able to calculate it mentally but let's look at a different method to get a bit of practice. We split $6.50 into $6.50. Then we start at $7 on the number line and count back $6 and then count back 50 cents. I end up at 50 cents, so we get 50 cents change. So when calculating change, we can choose to use any method that suits us. This time, we're going to buy more than one item. Hmm, what if I buy the small pencil case, the large pencil case, and the student desk from a $100 note? How much change will we get? The whole is $100. And there are four parts this time. One pencil case is $3, the other is $5, and the desk is $59. The change will be the other part. Altogether, we are spending $67, so I start at 100 and count back 60, then count back seven. I end up at 33. So my change is $33. Now let's practice these methods to become more fluent at calculating change. I have $20 to spend. What do you think we need to buy this time? Hmm. I need some pencils to put in my pencil case. So I will buy five of them for $2. And I also need a memory stick. That's $11.75. So let's see, I have $20 in my purse and I spend $2 and another $11.75. That means I spend a total of $13.75. The other part is the change that I have to calculate. Let's calculate the change by adding on from $13.75 to $20. Add on 25 cents to get to $14, and then add $6 to get to $20. So our change will be $6.25. Now, let's try it using a different method. Let's calculate the change by counting back from $20 to $13.75. 
Take away $6 to get to the nearest whole dollar. That's $14. Then count back another 25 cents to end up at $13.75. Our change will be $6.25. We have just checked our answer. Let's go shopping one more time. What do we need to buy this time? I'd like to buy some exercise books, a calculator, and let's see, I have $50 in my purse and I spend $1.90 on the books and another $15.99 on the calculator. $1.90 is 10 cents away from $2 and $15.99 is one cent away from $16. So we're 11 cents away from $18. That means I spend a total of $17.89. The other part is the change that I have to calculate. Let's calculate the change by adding on from $17.89 to $50. Add on 11 cents to get to $18. Then add $2 to get to $20. Then add another $30 to get to $50. Our change will be $32.11. Let's check our answer by doing another method. This time, we'll calculate the change by counting back $50 to $17.89. Take away $30 to get to the nearest $10. That's $20. Then count back another $2 to get to the nearest whole dollar. That's $18. Then count back another 11 cents to end up at $17.89. Our change is $32.11 again. We have checked our answer. This is an impossible amount to give in change. So we round it to $32.10. So today, we've learned how to add and subtract money in a variety of ways, including the part-part-whole diagram and the number line. Now it's your turn. You can calculate change any time you buy something. All you have to do is look at the amount of money you have, find the price of each item, and complete jumps on a number line to find the change. Eventually, you'll be able to do them in your head and won't need a number line. Why don't you practice when you next see an advertisement? Thanks for joining us. See you next time. One of my favourite parts of learning at Home TV is when we hear from students. This time we're asking about favourite foods. My favourite food is fresh fruit and I know that apples are a healthy choice. It's always good to have favourite foods that are healthy and nutritious to balance out our occasional treats. And I think Isaac agrees. Hi guys, I'm Isaac. We've been getting to know students from all across Queensland by asking them some fun questions. Today, we wanted to know what their favourite food is. Oh, I'm hungry now. Here are some of the delicious answers we've received. My favourite food is sushi. I love the combination of seaweed and rice. They go really well together. My favourite food would have to be burritos because I can put whatever I want on them. I love to put mints on them with salsa, tomatoes, and I love cucumber. It's just great. My favourite food is pizza, pasta, and rice. Two of my favourite foods are chocolate and hot dogs. My favourite food is nachos because it's crunchy. My favourite food is pizza because it's got lots of toppings on it that I like and it, it tastes good hot or cold and you can have it for any meal of the day. I like all foods from all around the world. My favourite is probably sweet more, more than salty because I'm a nice sweet person. My favourite food is spaghetti bolognese even though my mother doesn't like it. My favourite food is Vietnamese rice paper rolls. Ice cream because it comes in a lot and a lot and a lot. 
of flavors, but my favorite would have to be cookies and cream or rainbow. My favorite food is Mexican because it tastes really good. Now it's time for science. Have you ever heard the saying, take only memories, leave only footprints? It's important because we share our planet with a huge range of living things in lots of our favorite environments, like the place we go on a bushwalk or on a mountain climb, or when we go to the beach or, or for a swim in the river. Today, we're going to take a closer look at how people interact with the environment. Here's Jane with more. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have lived in Australia for many thousands of years, forming a special relationship with their environment and a strong spiritual respect for it. Over time, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have made careful observations about their environment. By observing living and non-living things in an environment, they are able to identify patterns in nature and make predictions. For example, Traditional owners use the life cycle of animals and plants to predict seasonal changes and availability of food in their country. By observing certain flowers bloom, traditional owners know when certain animals, like stingrays, are ready to eat. By making careful observations about the world around them, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples work scientifically to understand how living things are connected and depend on each in an environment. When people interact with their environment, they sometimes cause changes which can have an impact right away or in living time. These changes might be good for the animals and plants, we say they have a positive impact, or the changes might not be so good for the animals and plants, we say they have a negative impact. Let's look at an example to find out more. In Australia, we build lots of roads these are important for us to safely travel from one location to another, like going to school or work. But sometimes those roads are located where native animals live. Animals can be killed crossing the roads, which means there are less animals to reproduce and maintain the population. If less offspring are produced, it is less likely the species will survive. This is a negative impact on our environment. However, Humans can have a positive impact as well. In Brisbane, some people realised that the local road was making it harder for sugar gliders living in their area to survive. They came up with an idea to build an animal overpass, which is a crossing made especially for sugar gliders. Now the animals have a way to move safely across the road. They have also started to change their behaviour by using this animal overpass to cross the road. This has meant more sugar gliders survive and grow into adults, which means more offspring can be made and will ensure the sugar gliders will be with us for a long time to come. Now that's a positive impact. Let's look at another example of human interaction with the environment. Let's explore the Great Barrier Reef. The Great Barrier Reef is unique. It is the largest living structure in the world, located right off the coast of Queensland. It provides habitat or home for over 9,000 different types of animals and plants. And this rich biodiversity of marine life helps to maintain healthy coral system. The reef also protects the coastline from being eroded by waves, which is an important role in keeping our oceans and atmosphere healthy. Scientists have even discovered new medicines from the reef. Let's look at some of the interactions. It is also why the Great Barrier Reef is one of the world's most popular tourist attractions. Millions of people from across the world travel to the reef to enjoy its beauty. As the Great Barrier Reef is World Heritage listed, it is protected recreational area. This means that the interaction between people and the reef is managed so people can enjoy the reef while also protecting it. For example, tourism and fishing are only allowed in particular areas. 
This prevents the overuse of the reef and overfishing of marine life so that there are plenty of organisms left to grow and reproduce to maintain the species for future generations. Another impact of our interactions with the reef is pollution. For example, rubbish like plastic bags and straws can enter our waterways and end up on the reef, harming our animals like turtles and seabirds. But by carefully placing our rubbish in bins, we can prevent it even entering the ocean. So the negative impacts interacting with the reef can be reduced so that we can use it sustainably, that is, enjoy the reef for a long time while also keeping it healthy for future generations. Let's look closely at other interactions we have with the reef. There are a number of programs across Australia and the world that are making positive changes for the environment. For example, scientists called marine biologists are studying how to grow baby corals as part of the reef that have died. They are literally bringing the reef back to life. We can also make a positive impact through citizen science projects. These can provide all of us with the opportunity to contribute scientific work that helps to protect our Great Barrier Reef. Some projects allow us to monitor the health of coral reefs while we are snorkelling by using colour-coded charts. This data is then collected in an online worldwide database and can be accessed and analysed by scientists. So it is important for all of us to consider our interactions with the environment so that we can care for it for future generations to come. OK, let's recap what we've learnt today. Humans interact with the environment in ways that can have a positive or negative impact on the environment. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples work scientifically to understand relationships between living things in the environment. The impact of our interaction can be reduced by following special rules in protected areas and by contributing to citizen science projects. Now it's your turn. This afternoon, you might like to have a look around your local environment. Reflect on the impacts you might have on the plants and animals around you. Or perhaps you could find out about a local citizen science project you could get involved with. Thanks for watching. See you soon. Well, thank you for being such good listeners and taking part in our lessons this morning. How about you stand up now and get ready to move your bodies with a bit of cricket practice? Probably not with an apple though. After that, Victoria will be here to join our upper primary students and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye. Hi, I'm Jackie Orson from the Gold Coast Suns and I'm inside like all of you. So keeping active is really important for my health and wellbeing. And I'm gonna teach you some cricket moves. So to start with, we'll be doing bowling. So keep your arm up and arm go round and step and transfer your weight. So we'll do a few of these to get used to it. One more. And then after that, we'll be doing some lunge batting. So it's step, lunge, and with the same arm, we'll follow through. We'll do a few of these and we'll do both sides. Follow through and then we'll come through and we're doing some lunge batting. So we'll step forward and we'll bat like this. We'll swing the bat around as if we're trying to hit the ball. Do a few of those and get moving. That's all I've got for you today. I hope you have a good day and enjoy learning some new things. Thank you.